And at the beginning, this kid that the headmaster made uh, eat like this whole chocolate cake, he stands on top of this pile of, of desks and rubble with his megaphone and he says, never again will she get the best of me. Never again will she take away my freedom. And the part that almost brings me to tears is says, never again will I doubt it when my mommy says I'm a miracle. And I hope you find the connection between social media and that. Three, two, one. <laughs> so I've gotten a few questions, a few inquiries recently as to how we can handle this intoxicating mistress known as social media how to handle this this complicated beast what tips to follow uh, what tips not to follow and if you're like me I know what has popped into your head let's say it on the count of three one two three it's Raul Dahl's story of Matilda is that what comes to, to mind for you <laughs> You probably look. You probably don't have three girls under ten, and so you haven't you haven't read the story of Matilda, much less seen the musical that was released on Netflix a couple of years ago. But there's there's some great corollaries. There's some great symbolism in this story, and if you'll hang in there for just a couple of seconds, I I think this connection will be very valuable for you because it has been for me. This story, she's a gifted youngster, uh, loves to read, but her parents won't let her go to school uh, until one day she gets accepted into a local academy, and she, she shows up bright-eyed, full of enthusiasm. She's even singing a song about what her education's going to be like and and everything's going great until she shows up at the school and as she shows up all the kids that are at the school confront her and they say oi new kid you know because it's in an english accent they say so you think you're able i know this song because we've listened to it a hundred times to survive the mess by being a prince or a princess you will soon see there's no escaping tragedy. Now, why do, I, why do I use that analogy for social media? Well, I was thinking this morning that there's a lot of similarities to social media in school. There's a lot of similarities to how we approached school as a youngster and how inadvertently, unconsciously, we're approaching social media as adults. I think we we head into it bright-eyed, eager, with the alibi that we're doing it primarily for educational purposes. It's hard to argue with that. You know what? I'm I'm really on social media because I'm trying to learn about this, that, and the other. But if you go into it wide-eyed like that. I think that there is some some tragedy that is inevitable to befall upon you. So I'm Spencer Nix. This is the BPR podcast where we discuss the art of radical health and athlete design. And today we're going to be talking about tips for de-emphasizing social media and detoxing your life. Shall we begin? School is in session. The first thing that I want to communicate to you is that as an adult, and I assume that you are an adult because you're listening to this, you have graduated from school. I think it's great to recognize that you don't have to be in school anymore. You don't have to do any of those things. And let's just go over some of those things that whether you realized it or not, you believed when you were a, a school age youngster. Number one, there was an implicit curriculum that you couldn't argue with. There were classes that you were required to take. Algebra 1, geography, creative writing. There were things that you had no choice with and you had to, whether you liked it or not, participate in them. There was a mandated map of what you needed to succeed. And we were told that if we were wise, we would subscribe to these demands. Number two, we were told and we believed 
and we had to stick with something regardless if it was interesting or boring. I've got to read The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. And, you know, if you're like me, there were a lot of things that I did where I was like, man, I, I don't like this. There's nothing about this that I find interesting or enjoyable, but I'm doing it because I have to. Third, there were a lot of parts of school that you were doing for someone else. As early as first grade, you were told to go into school and to make your parents proud, to make good choices. All the way into graduate level education, you were probably told, we've given you so much. And so we hope that this education is really worth something for you. And so there was this pressure to not just do something for your own benefit, but to please other people. As well, we were told that authority figures were truly virtuous, that they were, they were benignly accurate and correct. Um, and they only wanted good for us. You know, we were told, you know, that the teacher will look after the child. And we don't think that we could know any better than, than the person that was instructing us. And lastly, we were told that exams were accurate representations of our value and that we were what we scored. Would you agree with that? I think regardless of the type of schooling that you went through, there was probably at some point times that you felt like that. That's not even to mention the social aspect. That's not even to mention the miniature society that school is, uh, including the cool crowd, including bullies, including this, this pull and this challenge of deciding whether or not you should follow the herd and do what other people are doing. And I imagine that you, as I have, have regressed back to being a student when it comes to social media. So what would it look like to, to leave the school of social media? Well, let's use each of those five criteria and talk about a distinctly different way of approaching that. Believe and even say out loud that there is no guaranteed set path to fulfillment. There is no authority figure on social media, myself at the front of the line, that knows. They don't know because no one knows. For you. And that's the kicker, isn't it? Even as a pastor or a professor on here, sprouting what seems to be like great advice, looking into the camera, <laughs> speaking with conviction, it isn't really for you. It's like Will Smith talking or breaking the fourth wall in Fresh Prince or Ferris Bueller doing it in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You think that they're talking to you and that's the whole point, but they're not really having your interests in mind. There's a disconnect. And I want you to remember that you don't have to follow a teacher's rules anymore. Secondly, in school, so many things are pushed on you and you like a, a good student willing to slug through something that is boring. You don't have to do that anymore. Boredom in the midst of doing or learning something on, on social media could be a, a great indication that you're not doing the right thing. And when I describe boredom, I mean that you forget what it is that you're actually doing. You have forgotten the reason that you are on that resource at this point in time. That's the same as reading the bell jar and forgetting like why you even care about this anymore. You're not paying attention. I want you to remember that you don't have to be patient or long suffering as you were when you were a child. Third, at a certain age, and, and this is one of the wonderful things about being an adult, no one's really telling you what to do anymore. You may think that, and sure, we have priorities. There are things that are important to us that we want to honor outside of ourselves. But there is so much latitude and freedom in how you can do those things. And that feels a lot different if you think about it than how it was with the rules and regulations of school when we were a kid. 
social media tells you that there is still the need to make your parents proud <laughs> and to don't disappoint us. But honestly, remember that no one is watching you. No one's grading your report card or telling you how much college costs so you'll do better. These authorities on social media, even if they say that it's for your good, they have no real plan for you. It may seem like they want your supreme good, but in reality, they want you to play their game, myself included. Everybody on social media has an angle. And I know what's going through your head. You're thinking, yeah, but this one guy, he said that he's he's doing it just so he can give us access to a, a college college course curriculum. You know what this pastor said he's just doing in the name of Jesus? Yeah, but they're still selling ads, and they still got it on social media. They don't have to do that. And so if they're asking you to subscribe to their channel, it is for their own benefit. Yes. I think there can be great education and great benevolency that comes from social media, but it's not all that it is. Would you agree with that? So remember, there's no authority figure over your life on social media. And worse still, we followed our teachers and our professors because we were told that there was a prize at the end of the year. There's no prize. There's no prize that they have to offer you. I have no prize to offer you. And I hope that you'll remember that. Lastly, as kids, we believed that our exams were who we were. At least most of us. <laughs> what was your SAT score? How many times did you get asked that in high school? It was like saying, hey, tell me, tell me how well your future is going to go. I mean, that's basically what that question meant, right? There are exams everywhere on social media. Look at the girl sticking her butt out at the, at the camera. That's a body fat and spray tan exam. Look, look at the guy working out. Look, look at the guy doing thrusters. That's a fitness exam. Hey, look at that great trip your brother-in-law took. That's a finance exam. Hey, look at how happy all these people are on social media. That's a life satisfaction exam. I hope if you don't hear anything else that I say, that social media is not an accurate representation of life, and these exams that you are seeing are not real. They are a small, microscopic snapshot of something that does not represent real life, and more importantly, it doesn't represent your real life. So in summary, social media is not school. You are not a child. You are a grown-up. And if you are justifying your use of social media as education, which I do as well, I hope you can make a distinction between how you will approach that education versus how a child would. Now, this is a small tangent, but I think it's a good reason why children shouldn't be on social media. I think that's a good reason why, until post-pubescence, a kid should not be allowed on there because they probably can't make a distinction between the real school that they're in and the fake school that's on social media. But you have a fully developed frontal cortex, and so I think that you can make that distinction. So as most of the stuff that we try to do on this podcast, it, the way my brain works is I find it helpful to try to think of a different way about things and to tap into others' wisdom and to start cognitively with, with maybe a different approach or a different reminder when I do engage in something like social media. But another question that I have gotten is, well, what are some of the protocols? Like, what are some of the interventions that you guys would do when someone comes in and we're looking at the system, which is their health, and there's all these different factors and subsystems, and let's say that we realize that they have a hard time with time management. Probably one of the first questions that we would ask is, well, what is your social media usage? And you might ask, well, why, why do you ask that? Well, because if you took social media off of your phone 
and all that was left are applications whose function is to make your life more efficient, the phone becomes pretty boring. The phone doesn't become this huge time suck. The phone looks pretty similar to what Steve Jobs first released in like 2008. And so if somebody says like, man, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed with, with stuff that I have going on. We want to ask about their social media usage. And yeah, you know, in a perfect world, we would just stop using it altogether. But I think that social media has become almost like food in a way. If you had a heroin addiction, we would just be like, hey, don't do heroin. If you have a social media uh, addiction, for some of us, it would be unrealistic to say, well, just don't do that. The same way as that if you had some issue with uh, disordered eating, we wouldn't say, well, just stop eating. Like, we got to find a way to actually navigate that. And so sure, maybe a really extreme protocol would be just stop all social media. And I do think that there are benefits from taking a a fast or a break for a significant amount of time to see what that would look like for your time allocation. I also think that if you use social media professionally, as we do, there are people that can help you with that. There are ways to create carousels and posts on the computer, but leave the posting and leave the engagement to those that do that professionally. So I think whatever your excuse for for not going on a fast and not wholesale elimination, there's ways to to at least experiment with that. But I don't want to get into to that as much today because I think that's honestly pretty straightforward. What I'd like to get into are ways that you could continue to use social media, but with good boundaries. I think that's a, a, an accurate word to use. And so with that analogy of school, it's like, what do, what do we do with that? And I think like most things, it's going to take some thinking, not just a different mindset of saying like, hey, there's some tendencies for us to revert back to school age behavior, but also thinking about what you want. It will require paying attention. It will require redirecting yourself when you make mistakes, which will inevitably happen. And it'll possibly require forming some new groups and a a quiet little rebellion. So let's get into some of those. And before we do, I want you to know it's not lost on me the irony of making a social media broadcast about how not to consume so much social media. But if you can handle it, hey, so so can I. So one of the first things that I think can be really helpful and that we experiment with here is to figure out exactly what your problems are, to figure out exactly what you need help with. Social media is weaponized to continually push information on you. And so without any filters, social media is designed to put in front of you things that you didn't even know you needed and to convince you that you have a problem there that you need to solve with a little bit of thinking before getting on social media it's easy for each one of us to know some of the things that we have a hard time with and then some of the things that honestly we don't struggle with for example i don't struggle with sleep so i don't need to go looking for protocols on sleep because it's not my problem. A good way to to frame this is that you want to use social media to pull and you don't want to use social media to push. Using social media to push means that you blindly get on this device and anything that's put in front of you because of your search engine or something you said in conversation, it's going to be front and center of what it is that you'll be consuming. You're going to need a filter to know the only times that you'll look to social media for answers is when there's something that you need to deep dive and actually problem solve. Otherwise, all that information is totally obsolete. Yes, I think that social media can be used for education. Yes, I think it can be used for inspiration but you need to be in charge of that, not the device 
and not the social network that you're a part of. Here's what I think that should look like. You are living your life, things are going fine, and then there's something that you want to learn about or shoot, there's something that you feel like is a problem that you need to improve. That's the right time to pull in resources from LinkedIn, from YouTube, maybe Instagram. But what happens is that instead of selectively pulling that information when we need it, we're, we're pushed upon by literal mountains of tips and books and podcasts and do this and here's the four steps here here's the three ways that I did this and we're so susceptible to that all of us avoid this at all costs and when you are served ask yourself the simple question hey is this my problem do I really need this are these things that I'm working on served better by this content or is this just going to bog down an already complicated system that I have? And I can tell you that as I talk to most people, it's not that there's information that's misleading or bad. It's just bogging down the system. Sunlight in your eyes, delayed coffee, a cold plunge, 180 minutes of zone two rucking a week, none of those are bad but we feel overwhelmed by all of the recommendations from all of these people that tell us this is what we have to do. And so when you see something, the first question is, is this my problem? Make sure you get sunshine in your eyeballs when you first wake up. Okay, is my problem waking up? Nope, I don't have a problem waking up or getting my day started. Then you don't need that information. So I hope that helps. The best embodiment of what I believe we should all be doing when it comes to social media is to act like an aristocrat. Boy, I bet you didn't think I was going to say that. But an aristocrat of the mind, if you will. We have a, a little joke, my daughters and I, that when we want to sound condescending to each other, we'll say, my good man. And then we follow it with whatever the request is. And when you think about uh, aristocracy, when you think about privilege, when you think about uh, being born into a large land endowment and title, there's a, a few things that go, that go with that. When someone who is a lord or a duke is being presented information, they will look down upon it. Why is that? Well, because nine times out of 10, it doesn't really affect what's happening to them because they are above it. Now, let's take away the, um, the manner and the title, and let's just say philosophically or psychologically, you take that same disposition. You have this device in your hand, and you look down upon it with disdain yet indulgence because as the lord or duke such as you are there are times that you must engage with the common folk with the town with the peasants around you and you do it with grace but you know that deep down in your mind most of that stuff isn't really for you most of that stuff is, is beneath you, and you'll see it. You don't reject it. But you take, the, you take the same protective measures of, of your inherited title that you do with your brain and take it any pushed content under scrupulous discernment and only engage if it serves your matter. I got to work on that a little bit, but I think we're, we're on to something there. The, the aristocracy of your mind, being really, really snooty with what comes into your house as you're engaging with this content. Okay, moving on. Now, next, I think there's a few activities because we're constantly checking our phone. There's a few activities where it would actually help to not have that thing around. Now, we've already talked about there's a time and a place for social media. There's a time and a place for education, for inspiration. So because we're not turning into a hermit, we're not taking our, our phones permanently away from us, I bet if you took some time, you could find 
several activities where you don't actually need your phone like right then and there with you. I'll give you an example of what I mean. I love music. I love Spotify. I love that I can recall any song that I want with just the touch of a few keystrokes. However, because I love music so much, I have a record player. Now, I, I want to tell you that I have that record player because I can discern between vinyl and digital that if you were to place a 110-gram vinyl record that I could, I could make that distinction. But the truth is, is that I can't. I can't tell a bit of difference. I don't, I don't know anything that the record player does that makes the audio that much better. I'm just being honest with you. But I tell you why I use the record player. Because it slows the experience down. It's the ultimate appreciation of that thing that I love, which is music. It's not because it sounds better. It's because I have to viscerally pull the record out. I have to set it on the record player. I can't seek back and forth between different songs. And that, to me, makes it really enjoyable. Do I do that all the time? No. But it's the same reason I go to the movies. It's the same reason that I cook instead of order Uber Eats. It slows it down, and it requires me to focus on the thing that I'm doing. I'm not checking my phone in the movie theater. I'm not checking social media while I got raw chicken on my hands. I do these things on purpose as a brief break from my phone. Here's another one, exercise. It breaks my heart when I see somebody exercise and their phone's right there and they're doing a set and then they're they're checking it. Or, man, they even have their phone up like recording a video of them doing that. Those things are, are minuscule and they're minor, but they're distractions nonetheless. And it would be the same as you playing in a uh, really spirited game of soccer or, or football. And then every couple of minutes, you're going into the stands to talk about your childhood emotions. They just, they don't, they don't really go together when you put those things or allow those things to like interact. And so having these activities that don't have any distraction, I put the phone where I can't find it when I exercise. I write the workout on something analog, like a whiteboard, chalkboard at home, piece of paper, moleskin, because I want to fully immerse myself in what I'm doing. My advice to you is to think through the things in your days that would benefit from not having any distraction uh, of social media. For, for most of us, we're not doing manual labor, but we are doing um, thought work. We are doing, uh, for some of us, like some work where we need a deep focus. And so that's another great uh, place that hey, the phone doesn't really need to come into that environment with us. That's um, at work. Man, that's on a walk for God's sakes. I want to punch somebody in the face when I see their head down and they're going for a walk. Like, you don't need that thing. You don't need that thing on the walk. And obviously with times that you're spending with loved ones. Now, the last thing that I have is very old school. It's very counterculture. But I think it does solve a lot of the problems, and it would be one of the interventions that I would give someone here in the gym. If you find a tendency to look to social media for advice, for education, it means that there's a deficit in your life. It means that this place that you're looking for wisdom is not really solving it the way that you need to, but it's no less something that you need help with. And that is tapping into the collective wisdom of people that are also caring about this thing that you're caring about. That's a, that's a noble ambition, and I want to recognize that. And this time with loved ones that we said just a second ago, I think that you can find something like that that can satisfy a lot of this, create a filter, and be a great anecdote to what you're trying to do through social media. Over a hundred years ago, there was a gentleman named C.S. Lewis, who was a 
professor at Oxford for English literature. And he started this informal writing and discussion group. So have you ever heard of this? It's a great story. He invited his friends to attend. One of the friends that he invited to attend was named John Tolkien, otherwise known as J.R.R. Tolkien. When this group started, neither one of these guys had written the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings trilogy. At first, it was this very informal writing discussion group. It changed where they would go in the morning to this pub called the Eagle and the Child, and they would have a beer. And this went on for years. They called themselves the Inklings. That was this group's name, the Inklings. The main function of this group, and there's been lots of people that have talked about this, but I think the main function of this group is that it was a group of friends who shared similar professional interests. In the context of what we're talking about, I would recommend that you find a group of people that have shared similar interests around taking their health seriously. The one requirement of this group is that you can't mention something that you haven't tried and you can't make a recommendation to consume any type of information unless you've really vetted it and experimented with it yourself. That means this is not a group to be like, hey, have you, have you seen the Alex Ramosi video on this? You can't, you can't do that. Hey, I, I've tried an ice bath for one week. Have you, have you tried it? You can't do that. This is a group of people that you trust. This is a discussion group. But it's only going to be perpetuating things that they actually have experience with. That's a great filter. That can happen in the gym. That can happen elsewhere. I'm in a part of a couple of those groups. And these guys, when they speak, I listen. I listen because I know they're not talking bullshit to me that they heard on social media. But it's something that they have a lot of experience with. And they wouldn't bring it to me, someone that they love, unless they know it would be for my great benefit. And even still, I have to ask myself that question, hey, is this my problem? Hey, is this the thing that I need? And so, yeah, hey, my big recommendation is to form a, a social group. It's true. But it's no less valuable. And I think the, the pendulum in this world of instant gratification of quick, cheap dopamine hits, the pendulum is going to swing back to slower methods. The pendulum is going to swing back to more real interactions with people. The pendulum is going to swing back to more discernment, more filter, and more control over all of the inputs that can have an influence on, on who I am and what I choose to do. So form your own inkling group. Now, in close, at the end of Matilda, spoiler alert, they overthrow the evil teacher, headmaster, and they, they break into truly a, like, badass dance number. I'm not kidding you. Every time I watch it, I find myself just kind of, like, want, wanting to follow what they're doing, even though I'm not a great dancer. The song's called Revolting Children, and the lyrics of it are amazing as well. And at the beginning, this kid that the headmaster made uh, eat like this whole chocolate cake, he stands on top of this pile of, of desks and rubble with his megaphone, and he says, never again will she get the best of me. Never again will she take away my freedom. And the part that almost brings me to tears is, says, never again will I doubt it when my mommy says I'm a miracle. And I hope you find the connection between social media and that. You've got to think through this stuff. And you've got to realize that social media should never take the best of you, should never take away your freedom. It should never tell you that you're anything less than a miracle. And I absolutely believe that, even though you know, I'm not really talking to you specifically. I'm really just talking to myself. So in summary, I hope that this is sparked a thought process for you. I appreciate the the inadequacy of social media, the the wholehearted attempts like the ones that I'm giving. 
I hope that this podcast, this information does do you some good. And if you do have a problem with this, that there was something that was said that can maybe spark an own revival or, or revolution for you. Thanks for listening.